Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Russ Harrison, Director of Government Relations for IEEE USA in Washington, D.C. This is our May 12th, 2022 legislative update, and welcome to May Day. I know it's not technically May Day, um, but I thought it was funny, so I went with the title anyway. Um, jumping right in, a couple of big events actually happen on this day for the Western Hemisphere. Uh, today is the anniversary of the founding of the University of San Marcos in Peru. There's a couple San Marcoses, but this one uh, is the first institution of higher learning in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and as all great uh, universities, it does in fact have an IEEE chapter there. Uh, today is also the anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Paris. That's the uh, treaty that formally ended the American War of Independence, uh, in which uh, Great Britain formally acknowledged and recognized the independence of the brand new United States. So kind of a big deal in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I need to, to back up a little bit and note something that I missed a few updates ago. Uh, you will recall that back in January, I believe, Senator Ben uh, Lujan from New Mexico suffered from a stroke. There was some concern that he would be gone from Washington for an extended period of time, which messes up the balance in the Senate and makes things difficult. Uh, at the time, uh, Senator Lujan said that he would be back mid-March, and in fact, he was, uh, apparently suffering no visible uh, side effects from his medical situation. Uh, so Senator Lujan is back at work and has promptly introduced the Spectrum Innovation Act, along with a couple other senators, including Senator Thune from uh, North Dakota, excuse me, South Dakota. Uh, the Spectrum Innovation Act frees up some mid-band spectrum uh, for public auction. That's spectrum that's currently allocated to the government uh, that would be available, available for public use. Uh, the bill is bicameral and bipartisan, although not necessarily overwhelmingly popular. Uh, spectrum management debates, uh, debates over spectrum allocation tend to be pretty contentious and controversial just because there's a fixed, as you know, a fixed amount of spectrum and an infinite number of uses for it. Uh, and so I don't expect this bill to go anywhere this year, uh, but it's off to a good start to initiate the next round of debates, uh, which could lead to legislation next year. But either way, we welcome the Senator back to Washington. All right, so our big bill for this year is the Competes Act still. Uh, negotiations have begun between the House and the Senate, the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, uh, a, one of the conferees, uh, one of the people doing the actual legis uh, negotiating, has called it the most, con most complex conference committee in history. And that's an exaggeration, but it's not an enormous exaggeration. Uh, the fact is, it, it, because the bill is so sprawling, because the differences are so vast between the House and the Senate, it's going to be a tough negotiation. And so they haven't made any real progress, but nobody really expected them to after only one week. Uh, it's really too early to say if there's problems or what those problems are, but we've already started to see some of <clears throat> the possible road bumps in the path towards getting this thing passed. Um, a debate has erupted over the R&D tax credit uh, and tax incentives for production of computer chips in the United States. The R&D tax credit, many of you are aware, uh, was passed into law several years ago, but there's some problems with it and some pieces that are expiring. Uh, and so there's a push to fix it, to make it more effective and to make it more permanent, which IEEE-USA supports. Uh, the microchip uh, tax credits, the uh, chip manufacturing tax credits would be in addition to the Competes Act, excuse me, the CHIPS Act. As you know, the CHIPS Act is in both the House and the Senate versions of the bill. So we do expect that to be in the final version, but these particular tax credits are not. Here's the problem. Neither the R&D tax credit nor the computer chip tax credit are particularly controversial or frankly all that expensive overall. The problem is they're also not in the bill. Technically, in a conference committee, the negotiators, the conferees, are not supposed to add new provisions to the bill. They're just supposed to pick some of the House stuff and some of the Senate stuff and maybe find some middle ground on a few provisions, and that's the final bill. Now, these are congressional rules, and as it is Congress, they can break them if people, you know, if they all agree. Um, so it's not like there's a law, but... If the rules are changed to allow 
non-germane issues into the bill, these are issues that aren't already there, it opens the door to anything. Uh, and that is the danger. If we support both tax credits, IEEUSA is on record supporting both of them, um, but there is a concern that an already incredibly complex negotiation is going to be made more complex if new issues are put on the table and putting any new issues on the table invites additional new issues to be put on the table, which is a concern. It's not as though there aren't enough already kind of unrelated provisions in one of the two bills. For example, there is a ban on mink farming in the House version of Competes. Um, why not? I mean, there's no reason to be a congressman, can, legislators can put anything they want in these things. Um, but there is a ban on mink farming, and that is turning out to be rather controversial. Uh, the House really wants to keep it. Um, the mink farmers of America are obviously not terribly excited about it. Uh, and the Senate is pushing back. And so mink farming is actually emerging as uh, a, a troubling subject in the negotiation of the Competes Act. Uh, immigration is, of course, always complicated. Uh, we've already started to see people kind of move to their traditional positions on immigration, which creates a stalemate. Uh, a group of about 30 national security experts sent a letter to Congress this week saying that the green card provision in, in the House version of competes is a wonderful thing and should be passed, which we broadly agree with, although the provision needs to be tidied up a little bit. But in general, we do support that. At the same time, some legislators have said, well, may, if we're going to do additional green cards, we need to add in some provisions on border security, which is a non-starter. Uh, other people have said, well, if we're going to let high-skill immigrants in, we have to do something for low-skill immigrants, which is a non-starter. And so the conversation is kind of devolving into where it's been for the last 15 years or so on immigration. Everybody thinks high-skill immigration is great, but it's always their second priority, and their first priority is problematic. So we remain optimistic. There was originally a uh, prediction from some legislators that this competes would be done in May, that the negotiations would be over this month. That never seemed likely, and it still doesn't. Um, we are still hopeful that we will have something resembling a final bill uh, before the August recess, and then that the bill, the entire bill, could be voted on in September or maybe December. Uh, remember, there's not a lot between September and December, not a lot of legislative time because of the election. Still looks like if competes makes it to the floor, it will pass into law. The trick is still getting it to the floor. Uh, one of many other little provisions that could, in theory, be tucked into competes at some point uh, is the SBIR STTR reauthorization. <clears throat> uh, these are uh, federal loans for research that can be used by small businesses, particularly small tech companies. Um, we expect a deal on the House version of the reauthorization legislation soon-ish, supposed to be this week, but it wasn't, so maybe next week. Um, once the House does their bill, the Senate is likely to follow shortly thereafter. Um, there's not a huge amount of controversy over this at the moment, uh, the plan would be the SBIR and STTR programs would be reauthorized for either one or two years. The deal there is <clears throat> congressional Republicans expect to control at least the House, maybe the Senate as well, um, next year. And so they want to take a harder look at these programs when they are in charge. And so they're only offering to reauthorize it until they take over Congress and then they want to do it again play games like this all the time up there. Um, IEEE-USA was hoping for a longer reauthorization, but it does not look like we're going to get it. More importantly, the reauthorization is likely to happen. Uh, there is a little bit of opposition in the Senate on principle. There are a couple senators who just don't like the programs because they interfere with the free market and they think they're a waste of money. Uh, there aren't enough senators who oppose the bill to stop the bill. But there are enough to complicate things and slow it down. And given you know the calendar and the mess that Congress is, slowing it down might be the same as killing it. The plan so far has been to not include any policy riders. That is, all the bill is going to do is say, the programs are reauthorized for a year, maybe two. Just keep doing what you're doing. And that's it. Um, IEEE USA had been working with Senate uh, staff 
to see if we can get some small tweaks to the program to make them a little bit better, a little bit easier for tech companies to use, a little bit easier for first-time applicants to use. But at the moment, it doesn't look like congressional negotiators have a stomach for that conversation. So we'll keep your fingers crossed. But the important thing is the bill will likely be reauthorized. This is exactly the kind of bill that can be tucked into the NDAA, the FY 2023 budget, or competes, or, or well, that may be just about it. There aren't a lot of other bills that are going to move this year. Uh, but this can be tucked into the last minute without anybody throwing, you know, getting too worked up about it. <clears throat> Two interesting uh, executive orders this week on quantum computing. Um, quantum computing was the hottest thing in Congress uh, in Washington about five years ago, and it sort of faded uh, in, into the background as the policy setting moved from the very exciting, you know, Congress and the president into the agencies who are actually, you know, making things work, which is far less interesting. Uh, but the president and the White House is still focused on this, which is good. Uh, so the first executive order placed the National Quantum Initiative directly under the president. Uh, he did that by putting the director of OSTP, the Office of Science Technology Policy, uh, in charge of the quantum initiative. The director of OSTP serves on the cabinet and is the president's chief science advisor. So at least in theory, this should make sure the president is aware of what the quantum initiative is doing. More importantly, it tells all the members of the quantum advisory committee that runs the quantum initiative, which includes the heads of most of the major departments in the U.S. government that, you know, interact in this space. It tells all those guys because the, the president put it where he put it because he cares about this. And so you have to care about it, too. And so even if President Biden never gets involved again, which it would be expected regardless of who the president was, it does tell his people, uh, his cabinet and his, the rest of the government, that President Biden thinks this is important and therefore it is a big deal. Uh, secondly, the president put out a national security memorandum on the risk, risks posed by quantum computing uh, to cybersecurity in this country. Uh, now, if you read the executive order, and executive orders generally aren't particularly interesting reading, you will notice that it seems fairly obvious what the second one is doing, because of course quantum computing has the potential to create cybersecurity risk for the United States. Um, that's kind of why we're doing cybersecurity, uh, why we're doing quantum computing. Um, but what the memorandum does is it declares, it's the president declaring that this issue is of, of importance to national security, which again elevates the issue. It tells the defense and intelligence community, you need to pay attention to this, tells the rest of the government that quantum computing is something we can't lose, we have to get it right. And so you, the agencies, need to make sure that happens. So again, the executive orders themselves don't look that interesting, but they actually play an important role in, in priority setting in, the, in uh, Washington, D.C., and so we're grateful for both of them. Uh, something interesting that popped up, and I want to make two points on this. Uh, a group of civil society organizations, that's the ACLU and a number of kind of privacy rights groups uh, in the United States, issued a public letter to Zoom asking Zoom to drop plans to add emotional analysis features to their webinars, which this is what they're planning. And I don't think they're actually in place yet. Zoom is trying to develop an AI that could read people on Zoom meetings to tell what their emotional state is, you know, I, which I presume would include how much attention they're paying to what's going on. The host of the meeting would then get access to that report, I assume for additional charge, after the call is over. <clears throat> That's causing some consternation by some people. Um, so the society sent the letter to Zoom and then they have a petition, an online petition they're developing to get people to sign, to send to the leadership of Zoom, asking them not to do this. All right, so Zoom is a private company. They could care less what civil society thinks of them. They're obeying the law. The law says they can do this, and that's kind of the end of the conversation. The civil society groups are, did not send the letter to legislators. So what are they doing? Well, what they're doing is the purpose of the letter is to get attention for their cause because they got a bunch of nice news articles out of it. The purpose of the petition, and this is true of almost all public policy petitions, anytime someone asks you to sign a petition to 
tell Nancy Pelosi or Donald Trump or whoever not to do or to do something. The purpose of the petition is not to influence public policy. Those petitions have almost no effect in Washington and everybody knows it. The purpose of the petition is to generate a mailing list. Groups that put them out use the petition to get people's names, addresses, and email addresses so they can go back to those people to ask them to become members, to give them money, to you know, do other events down the line that may be more effective. Uh, but it's about the mailing list. So that helps you understand what's going on here. But I think the reason this is going on is important. 30 groups, including you know the ACLU and some other big groups, believe that the threat of AI is sufficiently scary to the public that this is a good fundraising tool. And I think they're probably right. And so IEEE members who are in the AI space need to be aware that in the public space, AI is starting to get a little bit a uh, little bit risky. This is one of the reasons why IEEE and IEEE USA have been pushing for ethical AI, uh, ethical AI technology, and government oversight of AI systems to make sure that they are operating correctly and not harming the public. Because if we don't, and AI does harm the public, the 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 response from policymakers could be quite severe, and we want to try to avoid that. In other words, we're calling on people to be good citizens up front so the government doesn't force us to be good citizens down the road. Uh, last little thing, uh, Secure Act 2.1. Now, this isn't a bill that we're paying all that much attention to um, because it's a little bit outside our, our area, but I was asked about it uh, over the last week and a half by a couple members, and so I thought I'd mention it since apparently it is of concern. Um, Secure Act 2.1 is, not surprisingly, a follow-up of just the regular old Secure Act, which passed a couple years ago, made some modest but important changes to the retirement system in the United States, IRAs and Roths and all those sorts of things, 401ks and whatnot. Uh, Secure Act 2.0 follows on that series of relatively small changes. Uh, for example, it raises the age at which you have to take a required minimum distribution from your 401k. Uh, from 72 to 75 over the course of a couple of years. Uh, it broadens <clears throat> automatic enrollment policies for uh, uh, employee-owned, employer-owned uh, 401ks and other retirement schemes. In other words, when you go to work for a company with a 401k, you are going to be enrolled in it unless you specifically ask to be taken back out again. And Congress is trying to make that harder to do because they want people to save for their retirements. Uh, it, the bill indexes catch-up limits, uh, 401k catch-up limits to inflation, which is, you know, kind of more important now than it was a couple of years ago. Uh, and there's some small tweaks to uh, 401ks for small businesses to make it easier for smaller companies to form one of these things. From IEEE's perspective, the big implication is uh, that the bill would link qualified the qualified charitable d distribution limit or uh, donation limit uh, to inflation. Uh, so it would encourage people to give to charities and nonprofits, um, even if they have fairly high incomes, which is actually a problem, kind of middle income uh, people because of changes to the tax law have lost their incentive to give money to charities. And that's having some impact on donations in the United States, not a huge amount, but it's having some. So the Secure Act 2.0 passed the House of Representatives by the uh, nail biting count of 414 to 5 which is about as good as it gets. And frankly, there are very few policy bills that can pass, you know, that they can declare, you know, June 17th, National Popcorn Month with overwhelming uh, bipartisan majority. But this is a real bill that does real stuff and had that vote, which is kind of impressive. Uh, the problem is that there's no Senate bill. Uh, <clears throat> we have been told by senators that the Senate companion bill will be introduced this spring except you may note that this spring is almost over. Uh, uh, we are we only have about eight legislative days left in May uh, because of the Memorial Day recess. Um, and then we're in June and that's not spring. So we don't expect this to be introduced in the spring, but again, next month is more likely. Uh, we're kind of late in the legislative calendar. There is no standalone bill. So this bill is another one of those that can be fairly easily tacked onto something else at the end of the year. It is bipartisan. It is overwhelmingly popular. 
uh, it would be fairly easy to tack it onto something else. And that is the likely course uh, that it will take to passage, but we do expect it to be passed this year. Uh, speaking of charitable contributions, just to remind everyone that IEEE does maintain a number of voluntary funds uh, that collect donations from IEEE members and others for specific projects. Uh, IEEE USA maintains several of these funds, including the IEEE Fund to help us with special projects, the IEEE Fellows Fund uh, to help uh, support our Congressional Fellows Program, and our recently created Student Public Policy Fund uh, which supports our WISE interns, which is our undergraduate internship program here in DC over the summer, which we are very excited will be done in person this year. We are expecting our students to arrive just after Memorial Day. Uh, so if you're interested in those funds or any of the other uh, voluntary funds that IEEE maintains, you can see the entire list at www.ieeefoundation.org. Uh, our next update will be Thursday, June 9th. Please note that is not in two weeks. Uh, it, we will not be doing an update on May the 26th. I will be on vacation attending my son's graduation and trying very, very hard not to think about politics. So our next update will be our next regularly scheduled update uh, in June, which is June 9th. And with that... I remind everyone, I'm Russ Harrison. I'm the Director of Government Relations for IEEE in Washington, D.C. My phone number is 202-530-8326. My email address is r.t.harrison at IEEE.org. And it looks like we may have a comment or two. Let me go to that. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat, and I will respond to them as well. Uh Vice President Godfrey uh, asking about the Science Advisor OSTP director. Um, and the answer is no. Um, there hasn't been any movement in making the acting director permanent. Uh, I'm afraid, we were kind of afraid of this when, when the previous uh, director of the OSTP stepped down. Um, the unfortunate truth is OSTP doesn't get a tremendous amount of attention from the White House typically. Uh, the fact is science is just not as pressing usually as you know national security and some of the other issues that the white house deals with on a daily basis frankly research projects don't pay off in one year they pay off in 20 and so it's easy for the white house to say i oh, will get to that tomorrow um president biden to his credit moved very very quickly to appoint a uh, director of ostp at the beginning of his term However, getting his attention to turn to this again is going to take us a little bit of time, and that has weakened the OSTP and made it less effective than we had hoped. Um, but like I said, the president did put out a, a two executive orders on quantum computing, so he is paying attention to this stuff. Uh, and so there, we will be optimistic that this oversight will be uh, fixed soon. And let me flip around here. All right, I don't see any other comments today. I want to thank you all for joining us. It is a pleasure to speak with you as always. Have a great Memorial Day, and I will talk to you again in early June. Have a great afternoon. My superpower is engineering. I've been a roboticist almost all my life now. I think engineering is just as creative as the arts. Engineers, we solve problems. It impacts the world. It makes a difference. Without IEEE, I don't think I would have the network that I have. Anyone can get involved with IEEE USA at any time. There's an immense amount of value for anyone at any career stage.